Thank you very much to the invitation. It is a great pleasure to be here uh, at uh, Philp to speak about nuclear fusion. Also, it is a great pleasure because uh, we also have members of, of IPFN here at Philp, uh, Francisco Salzedas and Carlos Pinto Silk. So, uh, Philp is also uh, a part of IPFN. So, thank you very much. So, uh, I know that I'm uh, in an uh, audience that. Uh, uh, knows about physics, but usually when uh, I speak about uh, p that I work in plasmas, oh, this is not okay. This is usually what people think: blood, blood plasmas. Uh, and uh, when I speak that I, I sp I'm working about infusion, well, it doesn't go more much far. Sorry, this is where should I point it? Ah, okay. Basically, this is the other thing that people think about fusion. The only exception I found was a guy in Spain where I, I was uh, usually going to the market and buying fruit. And he asked me, what, uh, what do you do? And I say, I, I work in nuclear fusion. And the guy says, oh, that's the good one. I know. So <laughs> nuclear fusion is the good nuclear energy. Uh, and this uh, is really what we are working about. is a new way uh, of uh, producing energy with uh, nuclear fusion. Uh, I really should know where to point it. <laughs> OK, so it's moving. So fusion is the reaction that happens in the stars. Uh, and uh, it's all the stars that have around us are uh, having fusion uh, reactions. And for this to happen, we need uh, a plasma. And plasma is known as the fourth state of matter. Probably you all know, being uh, from physics. Uh, and. Uh, really not helping. There's probably a place to point. Ah, OK. 99% of the universe is uh, matter, visible matter is plasmas. And uh, like this is painful. Uh, so uh, how do we make a plasma? So usually, we need to give energy to the system. So to pass from the gas uh, state to the uh, plasma, we give e enough energy to uh, bring uh, or to strip the nucleus out of the electrons and we have a cloud of uh, uh, positive charges and electrons and, uh, uh, and this is a plasma. It's not enough, it's not just an ionized gas. The real definition of a plasma is okay. it's an ionized gas globally neutral because basically the uh, positive charges uh, and the electrons are more or, or less uh, equal and it exhibits a collective behavior. So this is the real definition uh, of a plasma and plasmas are very, uh, exist, are ubiquitous uh, in the universe and in our uh, lives. Patras, okay. So uh, plasmas are ubiquitous in the universe. So I mentioned about the stars. Uh, the solar winds that comes towards Earth, uh, the plasmas when we face the magnetic field, we have the uh, auroras. Uh, when we have a lightning, uh, we have a plasma. But we can also have plasmas in many processes. We saw several uh, this morning. Plasmas to cover, for instance, materials for different applications. Uh, we can have plasmas for uh, engines, for satellites, for instance. Or we can have uh, plasmas for cutting, plasmas for welding, or uh, like we have in IPFN, to simulate the reentry plasmas uh, when a, a spacecraft entered the, in different atmospheres. So this is our European shock tube for high enthalpy research, where we simulate different uh, reentry plasmas, or a work where Carlos Pinto Silva is involved uh, related to the plasma conversion of CO2 to create uh, oxygen in Mars. So this is, is also an application. Another one from IPFN that I'm really keen uh, about is the production of uh, uh, graphene and derivatives. Uh, this is a device where we, that we have four patents uh, on. And we are able to produce graphene uh, flakes, uh, N-graphene, doped graphene with ma many materials, nanoplatelets, nanodiamonds. So it's really a, a really nice device. And the proof is just here. So these are nice uh, graphene sheets produced with plasma uh, at IPFN. So in reality, plasma research is uh, growing. Uh, it has a huge community. It has huge scientific opportunities and challenges. 
and uh, it has many, many applications. So this is from 2010, a report uh, from the United States, but actually it's growing uh, in importance and applications. Um, plasmas vary in density and in temperature. We go from the very low temperature plasmas up to the very high dense, high temperature uh, plasmas, and they have different applications. So we have low temperature plasmas for us is uh, um, one of these lamps here, a fluorescent lamp, uh, which very low temperature, 10 electron volts. Uh, but for doing fusion in a lab, we have to go to temperatures that, it's, that are 10 times higher than the temperature in the center uh, of the sun. Uh, OK, so we already had in the previous uh, talk what is fusion. So nuclear fusion 101, the idea is to join uh, light nucleus and by being able to induce the, the fusion reaction in these lighting, uh, light nucleus, we are able to produce energy. And this is the, the goal is produce energy and transform this energy in electricity. The example I have here is the ethereum tritium reaction, uh, but it's one of the many reactions that can go the, where fusion can happen. Uh, and here we have many examples. So this is the cross section for, for several fusion reactions, deuterium tritium, deuterium deuterium, deuterium helium-3, proton borum, uh, helium-3, helium-3. The reason why I focus on deuterium tritium is just because it is the reaction that has higher cross section at lower temperature. And by lower temperature, we are speaking about 10, kilo 10 to 20 kilo electron volts. And this means that we have to achieve temperatures that are in the order of 150 million degrees to be able to, uh, to produce fusion. So to control these reactions on, on Earth, uh, we are not able to simulate the gravitational confinement that the stars produce. So on Earth, we can only use uh, magnetic fields uh, to confine the plasma or inertial fusion. Magnetic confinement is the one that is more promising for energy production. But this year, in the beginning of this year, uh, we had uh, very nice results from inertial fusion. And uh, when we speak now about fusion, there are many different ideas of how we can confine a plasma and achieve fusion. We have here five of these big ideas. We have magnetic confinement. We have a stellarator, which is also magnetic confinement, but with a different uh, magnetic ar arrangement with the coils. We have inertial confinement that I will speak a bit more. We have reverse field configuration. We have magnetized target fusion. There are many different ways. I will only speak uh, about uh, inertial confinement and then magnetic confinement fusion. Uh, to achieve a reaction, we need to uh, compress a target of, just to give you an idea, if we had one kilogram of fuel, we will need temperatures of about 10 kilo electron volts and we will need 10 to the 12 joule of energy. So this means it's about the energy required uh, by exploding 200 tons of high explosives, which is not very practical. So, and this would allow us to compress something that is the size of a basketball to the size of a pea and be to, to, to be able to do fusion. So we can do this with lasers. And how we do it with this with lasers? So we have a small pellet, smaller than a pea, uh, a very small pellet that we target with different beams all around. The beams eject material uh, when they become hot from the laser. Uh, and when they inject, eject the material, we have a reaction that pushes the target towards the center and we compress the target achieving a very high density and enough temperatures to achieve fusion and that's inertial fusion basically. And this is what is done in uh, the National Ignition Facility. So you see here the laser bay where you have all the lasers required, uh, sorry, uh, this, this has a laser. Yeah, there's a laser here. So you have the laser bay. These, uh, these are lasers from the 80s. Uh, this is important because it affects when we look into the energy. And we have here the target chambers. And in the middle of this target ch chamber that you can see that is very large, you will have a small pellet where you fire 192 lasers and we do, uh, in, a, in this small pellet and you are able to compress uh, the target. So basically this is what you have the target here just to give you an idea. So this is a, a pellet with deuterium tritium 
uh, and this is the size, and you put the pellet there in the middle, and then you try to heat it with 192 lasers, homogeneously, all around, to ensure that the compression is homogeneous. And uh, actually, they were able to do it. So in August 2021, they achieved 70% of conversion. What this means is that from the energy that the lasers had when they hit the target, 17% was converted in fusion energy that was released. So it still, it still required more energy than what was uh, required. But we know why. And the reason why this happened is because on one side we have instabilities that generates when you, sta when you start, uh, when you hit the target, you have these uh, Rayleigh, uh, Rayleigh Taylor instabilities uh, that makes that the, the compression is not homogeneous. And also because you don't have perfect symmetry on the target, on the target and also on the lasers all around, uh, then you have asymmetries, and because you have asymmetries, you don't have a perfect compression, and this uh, makes you lose uh, energy. Also, uh, not all the light that, uh, you, uh, that, that you send into the target becomes, uh, is absorbed. So you have scattering, uh, and uh, you have losses there. Uh, you have uh, the production of high energy electrons. Uh, that uh, lose uh, energy and that make the target expand, so it makes it harder to compress the target. And this also com uh, contributes for making it difficult to achieve inertial fusion. So the next step was thinking about indirect drive. So it's a slightly different approach. And in indirect drive, you have the, sm the same pellet of fuel, but now inside a cylinder, a gold cylinder uh, here. You hit the, with the lasers the walls of the cylinder. The cylinder starts to emit X-rays, and it's the X-rays that are going to impact on the pellet and that make the pellet to, uh, to start bursting uh, materials and to compress. And uh, with this, you are able to achieve uh, fusion. And uh, only 10% of these X-rays are absorbed by the capsule, and 50% of the energy is converted, uh, of the lasers are converted into X-rays. So this is uh, the other idea to produce inertial fusion. And uh, actually, so here is the whole run, which is the target. Uh, just to give you an idea of the size, the pellet of fuel is inside. Again, we have the same chamber. We have to put this in the middle of the chamber, and we have to eat it homogeneously. Not so much as, uh, oh, sorry, jumped one slide. OK. Uh, I don't have the other slide, but uh, with this arrangement, NIF was able to achieve 120% conversion. What does this mean? Is that with this arrangement, in, uh, this was uh, the result that was announced in the beginning of this year, they produced 20% more energy than the energy that was incident. Of course, people that uh, uh, are against fusion all immediately say, oh, but it's only the incident energy. The lasers spend a lot of uh, uh, energy, everything, all the infrastructure spent a lot of energy, and it's true. But actually, uh, we have to see that the whole infrastructure is from the 80s. So, for instance, just in lasers, laser, laser efficiency, it increased by about uh, 40 times since the 80s. So, lasers today would be 40 times more efficient. So, it doesn't matter for the accounts. But the important result here is that for the first time, we achieved ignition uh, in fusion for the controlled ignition. Of course, we already achieved ignition in the age bombs. Uh, but uh, for the first time, we were able to achieve uh, ignition in fusion in a controlled way. So we know that we are on the right target, uh, on the right track. But from translating inertial fusion into uh, fusion energy to produce electricity, there's still a long way. The problems that they will face in the end are very similar to the ones that I'm going to show you in Tokamaks. The energy, the, the production of the fuel, the materials, etc. But they have additional problems. One, is, one problem that you can think is that they do this uh, discharge once and then they spend days to put another target to repair everything to be able to do their days or months to be able to do another shot. We, to produce electricity, we would have to do this about 40 times per second. So you can imagine what it is to have a target there in the middle, to hit the target perfectly, to have homogeneous compression, to produce fusion every 40, uh, 40 times every second. 
with this type of arrangement. So this is quite complicated. That's why magnetic confinement is probably the way to achieve faster uh, energy electricity production with fusion. So for the magnetic confinement, uh, what we need is magnetic fields. With a magnetic field, uh, we are able to trap uh, or to confine our uh, charged particles from the plasma and to uh, reduce the movement that they have towards the wall of our device. And this is important because we have a very high, uh, we have a plasma with a lot of energy. If the, the, most of the particles hit the wall, we would uh, melt the wall we would damage our device. So we use magnetic fields. And uh, how does it work? So basically, the, the, the basic idea behind the tokamak is that you have a donut shape, uh, a torus. Uh, inside the torus, you have the plasma. You have this toroidal field cause that induced uh, a magnetic field, a toroidal magnetic field. And then you have a transformer here, where the plasma is the secondary of the transformer. And with this transformer, you induce the current in the plasma. And when you induce the current in the plasma, you have a second magnetic field, the poloidal magnetic field, that overlaps with the toroidal magnetic field. And you have this helicoidal magnetic field. And it, it, it is this magnetic field that confines the plasma inside my, my device. So basic, how we build a fusion device. We start with a donut, not really a donut. Sorry, this is from the presentations for the secondary schools. <laughs> uh, so not really with a donut. Uh, it's a donut-shaped uh, vacuum vessel. Uh, around the vacuum vessel, we put the toroidal field coils. In this example, we have 24 uh, toroidal field coils that will, go, that will be energized up to three Tesla. In this example, this is jet uh, in the United Kingdom. Uh, the, these are cooled coils with a fluorate uh, component called Galden. Uh, it's not important, but they are cooled because we have to energize them. There's a lot of current passing. It, they will become very hot. And when we have coils and we have magnetic fields, everything tends to twist a lot. So we need a support structure of 2,600 tons just to keep it all in place. We need another coils there. And these coils are coils that are used first to position the plasma inside the, the chamber. And second, to uh, elongate the plasma inside the chamber to give shape to the plasma, because it was found that these elongated plasmas are more stable than circular uh, cross-section uh, plasmas. Then we have here the transformer uh, limbs. Uh, and then we put pipes and cabling, et cetera. And everything becomes quite complicated. So this is a scheme. This is reality. And I invite you to find Waldo here. Uh, so if you didn't see Waldo, he's there. Uh, so, uh, th so you have here, basically from this concept design that I've shown you, the only thing you can recognize, and it's just, just because it's orange, is this, the transformer limbs. All the rest is there in, in the middle uh, of this uh, device. Inside of this device, uh, we have the donut shape, the toroidal chamber, fully covered with tiles. And tiles are important to protect the vacuum vessel from the interaction with the plasma. In this example, the JET, which is uh, the European tokamak, operate, uh, the only one that at the moment has <coughs> the capability to operate with nuclear fusion, uh, to perform nuclear fusion, uh, at, sorry, uh, at JET, we have beryllium tiles on the walls, tungsten tiles on this bottom part, which is the diverter. What you see here, you see here, uh, antennas for radio frequency heating of the plasma. And what you see here is the plasma. Actually, the most interesting part of the plasma is what you are not seeing, because it's not emitting on the visible range. And we are using a visible ca uh, uh, camera. Uh, you see here the interaction of the plasma with the diverter. That's why you see here some more light. But basically, this is what is going on. And the temperature here is between 10 to 20 kilo electron volts. And this is the temperature required to achieve nuclear fusion. And basically, how do we do it? So we start with a central solenoid creating an electric field. The gas is added and ionized and to create the plasma. And during the poloidal field growth, we have these coils that position the plasma, the poloidal field coils that position the plasmas in the center of the chamber. Then uh, we have 
the other coils that elongate the plasma to fill in the whole chamber and give this D-shape to the plasma. Then we heat the plasma, and by heating the plasma, we achieve the conditions for nuclear fusion. Let's see what is going on inside. So this is a, a jet discharge. So it's a normal discharge at jet. It is not deuterium-tritium. This one is deuterium-deuterium. But it's enough for us to do all the study of what is going on. You see here some instabilities that generate on the edge. The, those are called the edge localized uh, modes, are like uh, more or less like solar storms in the sun. And uh, you could see there that uh, these bursts were following around the tokamak. They were following the magnetic field. So inside this is what is going on. And JET is important because the, it demonstrates uh, that we are in the right track. So in 97, it was able to uh, uh, produce 22 megajoule of energy. And uh, last year, we were able to achieve 59 megajoule of energy. We injected 33 megawatts, and we got 11 megawatts of fusion energy for five seconds. It's not brilliant. It's 33%, are you thinking? Yeah. Uh, it's not that brilliant, but it's a great result. Uh, first, because five seconds for the time scales of the phenomena that is going on is almost the same thing as being infinite time. So it's enough for studying what is going on. And 33% uh, is on the right track because we know exactly what is missing to go to the next step. And I'm going to show you what is missing. But before, let's see this, uh, this result. So it's a pity that you, don't, you cannot see the sound because it's nice with sound. But uh, this is the discharge with the, the result. Oh, OK. You can hear the sound. Of course, it's not the sound of the plasma. It's the sound of the torus all and all the machine vibrating. And that's it. Five seconds of fun. Usually, at jet, we have 20 to 40 seconds of fun. And then we need to wait 20 minutes for the coils to cool down. Uh, but uh, we can do another discharge. It was not in this case uh, th that was uh, what was done. This uh, was a specific discharge prepared to achieve this very important result. Now, uh, why? What we need more? So we need to achieve ignition. And if for to achieve ignition, we need to heat the plasma, and then this alpha particle that is produced on the reaction needs to deposit the energy into the plasma to self-heat the plasma. So we need the plasma to keep, uh, to become hot and continue hot by the position of the alpha particle. And uh, this should be the heating, external heating, plus the alpha particle heating should be at least equal to the losses. It, but ignition is achieved when we are able to remove heating. And just by alpha particle heating, we are able to have higher power than the losses that we are having. So uh, this is the next step and what is required. What is required is a bigger device, basically, because we need to reduce losses to the edge and we need to give enough time for the particles, the alpha particles, to collide with the plasma to deposit all the energy. So we need a bigger device. And the bigger device uh, is called ITER, the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor. The aim is to prove the scientific and technical viability of fusion. It will have a power of 500 megawatts fusion power, 300 seconds to up one hour of discharge, and the amplification factor of 10 to 20. It will produce 10 to 20 times more energy than the energy that we input to start the, reac the reaction. And with this, we will test the integration of the technologies required for a fusion power plant. So first thing, where is Waldo? OK, Waldo is there. So you see that the device, uh, Waldo is smaller, and the device is much larger. The device, we had 80 cubic meters on jet. We will have 840 cubic meters on ether. The rest, most of the things you can recognize from the previous components, and we will see them in detail after. So you have the vacuum chamber. You have the tiles, the protecting the first wall tiles. You have the toroidal field coils. You have here some cuts of the poloidal field coils. Uh, you see part of the transformer here in the center. The only thing that is different here is the cryostat, because we are using in ITER superconducting coils, and those have to be refrigerated. So we need a cryostat. And uh, the, the, the toroidal magnetic field will be around 5 tesla uh, on, on ITER. It's an expensive. Um, 
project, uh, and it's growing. Yesterday there was some news on the Scientific uh, American. Uh, there was some editorial or some, uh, some, uh, some article about uh, the, the cost that is growing and there are some delays. But actually, I don't have here the graph, but if you do the accounts and look, for instance, into war in Iraq, you will see that uh, during the war on Iraq, you would have built 30 uh, eaters, at least. Every uh, Olympic Games, the money spent on an Olympic game, you would build half an, an eater. So this means that for the scale of things that are happen, happening worldwide, it is expensive for science, but it's not that expensive. Uh, now, some facts, just to understand the sheer scale of, of this project. So we will use 800,000 uh, 80, uh, uh, kilometers of neobidium team superconductor in the toroidal field coils. Each coil weighs 360 tons. It's the weight of a Boeing 747 fully loaded. It will have uh, 23,000 tons. It's three times the Eiffel Tower uh, uh, weight, and by the way, I had a, a more uh, local uh, figure. So it's about six times uh, Ponta Dona Maria, Ponta Dona Maria here, uh, the weight which is 4,000 uh, tons uh, of metal. Uh, so 360,000 tons of concrete on the walls and on the slab that supports it. Uh, 10 million components is 10 times the number of components on an Airbus 380, A380. Well, I already mentioned the temperature, 150 million degrees. Uh, this is uh, 10 times the temperature in the center of the sun and doesn't even have any comparison with the surface of the sun that is at 6,000 degrees. The volume, I already mentioned, 840 cubic meters, and it has a height of, 30, of 73 meters. Just to give you an idea of the size. So these are the seismic... Uh, so these are plinths with some seismic uh, dampers uh, here, 180 meters. These are all, these is, there's a slab that goes over the, here, these uh, uh, seismic dampers. This is to prevent that the ma machine is damaged uh, if uh, an earthquake happens there, an earthquake that happens in the south of France e every 10,000 years or something. But if it happens, it, it, steer, it, it shakes, but it doesn't break. And uh, also because there will be movements when the machine is operating. And uh, this will uh, oscillate and the dampers are there to ensure that everything goes well. Today, we have all this slab around these dampers. And above this, the machine is being built. Actually, the machine uh, now, with all the tools, is so heavy that some of these dampers have to be, so you have here these, like you have in the cars. <laughs> to lift the car, so you have several here in the middle uh, of the slab just to support the weight that you are putting there uh, because it's, it has to support the 23,000 tons of weight from the device but also now has to support all the tools that are going there to put the machine inside. And uh, this is the building. Uh, I just have this figure which is from 2016 just to, for you to see. This is the assembly hall and you see here the tokamak pit. We, I'm going to show you more of the tokamak pit, but basically the tokamak goes inside this hole. Uh, today, what you have is the assembly hall here, fully built. That's where the components are assembled, and then they are moved inside the pit here. So the torus hall. And inside, what you have is this. This is the tokamak pit. What you see here around is a biological shield. These walls are two meters thick. So these are uh, concrete uh, nuclear specifications, so we cannot uh, have any cracks. It can, you cannot drill uh, any hole in there. So you need uh, these to protect the exterior from the neutrons that are produced uh, in, the, uh, in the reaction. Uh, just a, a curiosity, because it's, uh, it's important, because when you have physicists designing things, sometimes you forget, forget the part of the engineering. So, because you are using concrete uh, for nuclear facilities, it means that if you want to attach something to the walls, you don't go there with your black and decker and drill a hole. You cannot do it. So it means that when you start designing your uh, systems, you have to know where you, you are going to attach everything. Because in that place, you need these uh, inserted plates. You see this patchwork here. 
and uh, every uh, insert plate that is here as a function, something will be drilled or welded in there. It's the only place where you can put stuff. And of course, when the physicists start designing, well, they foresee that they needed 10,000 inserted plates. When the project went ahead, suddenly they needed more than 100,000 inserted plates, and all the project had to be redone. So uh, usually this happens. Uh, physicists think everything. They simpl physicists simplify everything. If you could approach the tokamak to a sphere, it would be great. Uh, but and if it was a sphere, a sphere in vacuum without any inserted plates, it would be even greater. But uh, of course, engineers need, for engineering, you need a bit more. Uh, so this is one of the small problems that impacted on designing the building. Uh, now, what we have inside. So first, we have a vacuum vessel. The vacuum vessel, so you see here the structure of the vacuum vessel. Uh, so it's a donut shape. You see here all the ports where we can put components. So these, those are we will put components in port plugs, so these will act as plugs that you put inside the ports with all the components that are required for that port. Then, this is one of the sectors from the vacuum vessel. So you see it's double wall, you see it here. Inside you have these supports, that's where you are going to attach your uh, wall uh, uh, to protect uh, the, the vacuum vessel. Uh, this vacuum vessel has to support huge thermal loads, huge mechanical stress, and has to survive the uh, high energy uh, neutrons bombardment. So it had to be specifically designed even from the point of view of materials. So it's made of uh, um, uh, Eurofair stainless steel, which was designed to cope with uh, radiation, special, specially designed for this application. Uh, so it's two times bigger and 16 times heavier than any previous tokamak. It will always operate above 100 degrees. Uh, it's made of 60 millimeter thick uh, stainless steel, special grade stainless steel. And it's uh, a very large component. This gives you an idea. Uh, it will have 12.5 uh, kilometers of welding. Uh, so you have to weld uh, everything. And to add to the complexity here, it will ma be made Part of the sectors will be made in uh, Korea. The other part will be made in Europe. And this would be already enough uh, complicated. But then uh, one of them decided to do this by hot pressing the, the materials to bend the, the, uh, the stainless steel. And the others decided to do by cold bending, uh, which means that the, the sectors are not equal. So uh, basically, you can imagine it's the same as entering uh, an airplane where one wing would be made on one, one fabrication process, and the other wing would be done with another fabrication process. So would you trust? Well, we will have to trust that uh, everything is, works, but there are some risks associated. But actually, if we want to accelerate, we really needed to spread uh, this uh, manufacture. Uh, so it has different parts. You have to weld uh, everything together with specially, uh, or special weld uh, techniques, uh, tungsten inert gas uh, welding process. And, uh, and then uh, you have to put not only the, uh, these, uh, not only the supports inside for the blanket, but you also need to put these bosses. What are the bosses? You are going to put equipment in, inside. So you are going to pass cables, conduits, a, a, anything inside. And this means that you have to attach it. But you cannot attach any, uh, like we could not do it in the building, also inside the vacuum vessel and in the exterior, you cannot pass the equipment where you want. So you have to do the calculations to know where you want your component. And you have to put these bosses here, these supports, that are designed in such a way that they are able to sustain all the foreseen forces that are going to impact on them. For instance, if you have a disruption, if you have induced, uh, in induced charges uh, or induced currents, for instance, that could rip your uh, material, this is designed to sustain those uh, charges. So this is quite important. So you have to design the bosses for each component that you are putting inside. It's the, way, the only place where you can attach your components. And again, this is something that is very specific of each sector and what you are putting in that sector. So this, and you have un several hundred of bosses to support instrumentation and cable trays. Now, 
You have the vacuum vessel. Then around the vacuum vessel, you put this thermal shield because you have the vacuum vessel, and which is hot. And then on the outside, you are going to put the superconductor coils, so which is, which is very cold. So you need this thermal shield, which is completely covered with silver, uh, to uh, to act as barrier from the outside to the inside. Actually, uh, I'm going to speak just to give you an idea of the material. So. The core of the plasma is 20 kilo electron volts, and the density is 10 to the 20. The edge of the plasma is 200 electron volts. Roughly, you can think one electron volts is 11,000 degrees, roughly. So uh, you can see that it's hot, even on the edge of the plasma. And the density is 10 times lower than in the, in the center. Then you have the diverter, where you have less than 50 electron volts, but you have a power load, power deposition of 5 megawatts per square meters. This is jet that operates today. On ITER, you will have at least 10 megawatts per square meter power deposition. So you need to start thinking about materials. Also, you will have much more neutron flux, absorb those rates, plasma radiation, neutron heating, and all these with a very large pulse length, which adds to the fluence, which is 100,000 times higher than present devices. So this means that ITER it's completely different from the point of view of design, and you have to take into account all <coughs> these details. And that's where materials are important, and the plasma facing components are very important. So just to give you an idea, on a sunny day, we have one kilowatt per square meter. A space shuttle uh, on the reentry would sustain about 500 kilowatts per square meters. Ether blanket, the walls, will support 5,000 kilowatts per square meter, and the diverter at the bottom will have to sustain 10,000 kilowatts per square meter. So how do we select materials? So first, we need a very high thermal conductivity material to conduct the heat. And for that, the best material would be CFC, carbon, graphite. This would be great. And it was used on jet for several uh, years. Uh, also, tungsten is very good for this. Then you would need good thermal mechanical properties. Again, CFC is great for this. Uh, you need low neutron activation. CFC is great for this. Beryllium is also very good. You need resistance to radiation damage. And CFC is very good also. And now you are thinking, so if CFC is so good, why they are not using CFC? We used for quite a while. But CFC has one problem. It's low. Uh, it has a very high chemical affinity with hydrogen. So with CFCs, CFCs grab hydrogen. And because they grab hydrogen, they also grab tritium, which means that you, in a given moment, if you inject tritium into the device and you have CFC there, you, don't, you lose track of how much tritium you have inside. And from the point of view of nuclear authority, this is not acceptable, so you cannot use CFC. You had to you, we had to find another material. So the other materials possible are tungsten and beryllium. They have low accumulation of hydrogen. Uh, because they have low chemical affinity with hydrogen. Also, there's an, another advantage. So beryllium has a low uh, atomic number. This is important because if you, your plasma hits the walls and you strip material into the plasma, if you have a very high Z material, what you, it will happen is that you cool down your plasma. Basically, because you are introducing a lot of electrons, you have to strip uh, the nucleus of, out of these electrons, so you are losing energy. So if you have a very high Z material, you will lose temperature in your plasma. So you will, lose, uh, you, will, you will lose your temperature and you will need more power to heat your plasma. So we try to have as much as possible low Z materials. And that's where beryllium enters. Uh, tungsten uh, on the diverter is important because it has a good thermal conductivity. Uh, it has a, a very high melting point. Uh, so that's why we decided on the area where we have a very high power deposition, we put tungsten, but on the, all the areas around, we used uh, beryllium. So basically, the idea is we have about 700 uh, square meters of beryllium all around. Sorry, wrong button here. And we have tungsten on the diverter. And what we have is these uh, tiles that are welded or brazed or hyped into copper where we pass a fluid to cool down 
the wall. Uh, there are different, these are different uh, prototypes and mockups and uh, tests that were done. What happens when the wall are, is near the plasma? So you have the plasma. The plasma will send fast, will send very hot particles. Some of them will escape the magnetic field and goes towards the wall. So they will impact the wall. Some of them will be, will be retained on the wall materials, will be absorbed by the wall materials. Some of them will be reflected, but they are reflected, but they deposit energy. So they will be reflected, but cooler, which will cool down the plasma. Then we have, in this impact, you may have some erosion. Uh, this erosion will add to contamination of the plasma, also cooling down the plasma. But in some cases, you just have a migration of this material that will be redeposited in, in another place around the device. And in this deposition, you may have the tritium buried between uh, the materials. So basically, just to give you an idea, on a discharge on ether, we can expect up to 0.5 millimeters per shot of erosion of the wall. And this will only uh, work if the migration of material and redeposition is at, least, uh, is at least as much high as the erosion in every place. Otherwise, we will lose the wall very fast. So this is one of the challenges. And also it is important that we are able to uh, reduce the redeposition and with this redeposition to reduce the amount of tritium that goes uh, within these materials. Another problem is because we are on a radiation environment, materials suffer a lot of damage. Here we have some examples. So you open uh, voids in your materials, in the cr uh, crystalline structures of your materials. You introduce impurities in your lattice. Uh, you have vacancies in your lattice. Uh, so you have rearrangements in your lattice. All these contributes to degrade uh, your material. And when you have degradation, you can have, for instance, this is an example, tritium permeation. Tritium can go through your material pass through the voids and you want to, this is something that you want to avoid but it needs to be studied you need to avoid that it passes through your materials for instance and goes into the coolant so this it, it requires a lot of studies on materials actually on fusion uh, now it's being built in Granada if Donis, which is a facility just to develop materials for fusion uh, and this is uh, it's quite a, an important project for the next step Another example of what can happen, so this is a tungsten uh, tile that was subjected to a machine gun, a plasma, uh, uh, to a, a plasma uh, gun. And you see here several events, that, several things that happen. First, melting on the edges. And you see that the melting starts migrating. But because you are damaging your lattice, sooner or later you will have cracks. And cracks have edges that start melting. So you are damaging your uh, material. So we, this will be quite crucial. For it, there probably will not be that crucial. But for the next step devices, further work has to be done uh, on materials. So having said that, how, it is, how does the ether blanket look like? So we have 440 first wall panels. They are attached to these bosses that I've shown you inside uh, the vacuum vessel. Uh, they have cooling channels in there, and they look like this. This is a prototype. Uh, there are 32 major and 100 minor design variants because it has to cover all the device uh, around. So you see these are the blocks that attach. These are the blanket shield blocks. And over these blanket shield blocks, just notice this shape here because you will recognize it here. You see? This attaches with the cooling channels that you see in here. And in the front, you have these uh, first wall panels. And here in this example, what you have is 6 to 10 millimeters layer of beryllium uh, uh, bonded to copper alloy with the cooling channels inside that are attached and goes over these blocks. And this becomes the wall of your, the first wall of your uh, device. So this is just an idea how, how it attaches and uh, how it's fixed. But you see here, sorry, you see here the cooling channels, etc. So and you required very many different designs. Uh, now, toroidal fuel coils. 
just to give you an idea. This is the sh the, how the toroidal fill coils look like. Uh, each one has to be able to operate five to seven Tesla. Uh, this is just an example from, this is from K-Star uh, in the South Korea, but gives you an idea of all the uh, superconducting f uh, filament here inside with cooling channels. So roughly it is how uh, ITER will be. Uh, it gives an idea. Each coil will have 360 tons. It will operate at six, uh, 68,000 ampere. Uh, this is the operation current. And you, it will produce 120,000 gauss. So this to produce the five Tesla uh, toroidal fill coil in the middle. It has 16 meters height and uh, nine meters uh, width. And uh, this is how it looks like, but this is reality. So it gives you an idea of how these coils look like. And uh, here you see the vacuum setter. So this is in the, in the, in the assembly hall. It's a nice picture because you, show, you see the vacuum, vector, the vacuum vessel with the bosses where the, the blanket goes. You see the thermal shield is already in there and you have the, fill, the toroidal field coils already around it and they are being assembled in series. And inside, this was uh, some months ago uh, in May 2022, the first sector went into the tokamak pit. Uh, and we were very happy. But then a small problem arose. Uh, people realized that there was some, uh, uh, remember the thermal shield with silver that I mentioned? It had some cracks. And uh, it was very weird because when the first time I saw the report, I didn't understand why, how did the cracks appear on this thing? So it, the, the thermal shield has a lot of cooling channels. And the thermal shield uh, is made, I don't remember the material, sorry, it's a metal, but it's not silver. And, uh, uh, and the, the cooling channels are welded on that, material, on that uh, metal. But then to be able to deposit uh, uh, silver, it has to be washed with acid before. And it was washed with acid. And then it has to be cleaned. Apparently it was not very thoroughly clean. So it was not perfectly clean. And they, then they deposit the silver. Uh, but in the areas where the acid was not very clearly uh, clean, uh, we had uh, corrosion. So first problem. Second problem, the tools designed to put this sector in were not designed to take it out. So and uh, actually, uh, this goes from the, the assembly hall through the top of the assembly hall. It has a clearance to the wall, to the roof of about 10 centimeters on the top and on the bottom. And the tools were designed to go in and put it in. And now they had to think, how are we going to take it out? Because we don't have the tools. So it took some time. So the sector now is going out. I don't know, actually, I don't know if it is already out, but it's going to be removed. All the thermal shields will have to be redone. And this adds some delays. Uh, Poloidal fill coils. So uh, I mentioned the poloidal fill coils are important to shape the plasma and to position the plasma. They go around the vacuum vessel. Uh, so you see here one of the big ones. So these are the ones that are on the, on the uh, equatorial plane, so near the equatorial plane uh, of the vacuum vessel. And here you see a smaller one that goes in the bottom uh, of the vacuum vessel already in the torus hole. So it gives an idea of uh, how it looks like. Now, uh, this is what I mentioned. We need the thermal shield. So it's very hot. The t temperature excursion from the inside to the outside is very large. So you need the thermal shield that needs to fit like a glove. And here you can see quite well the thermal shield. And you probably even can see some of the pipe, pipes that are around the cooling channels that had problems in there. So this is what is being now written. And then you need a cryostat. A cryostat, uh, why you need a cryostat? You are using superconducting coils. You need to put helium in and you need to keep it all cool at minus 268 degrees. Uh, so it requires a cryostat. So this gives you an idea. This, is, this was the cryostat in K-Star. It's nice when you look inside, you see all the copper and gold foiled uh, uh, cryostat inside to prevent radiation to be absorbed. So basically it's a doer. Uh, and uh, here you see the cryostat is 31 meters B, uh, uh, height and 36.5 meters diameter. 
And you see one of the sectors going in, 375 tons. So this is the lower part of the cryostat going in. And here you see the cryostat. You see the cryostat against the, the, the biological shield. And you see the poloidal field coil already in. So next will be the next part of the cryostat, everything welded to close it all. And then we have the pumped diverter. The diverter is quite important. So when you have the toroidal field, the lines of the, uh, not the toroidal field, the, the magnetic field inside the tokamak, the lines are, uh, the, the magnetic field lines are done in such a way that they are closed. In such a way that a particle that is trapped on the magnetic field goes around and closes again after some circles, depending on the surface where it is, after some turns around, returns to the same point. The problem is that by collision, you have diffusion of these particles to the outside. And some of them escape from the magnetic field. So the, line, the magnetic field lines on the edge go straight into the bottom. What it means is that if you have a particle that goes to the edge, they go very fast parallel to the magnetic field and they are directed to the bottom. Hopefully, faster than they go radially uh, to prevent them to hit the wall. So you have a lot of particles being redirected to the diverter. So you need to design the diverter in such a way that it sustains this power load. That's why we need tungsten in there. And that's why it is active water cooling. But the diverter has a second function. Once all the helium uh, keeps the plasma hot, it becomes the ashes of the reaction, basically. It becomes a waste of the reaction. So you need to extract this cool helium from inside the plasma. And this diverter is pumped in such a way that the helium goes and you remove it from, under, from underneath the diverter and you remove the helium. So the pump diverter is also used to remove the helium ashes. And by saying ashes, I'm taking a big risk because I'm going to tell you a, a little story of how I learned to communicate with journalists. Several years ago, we had a, a, a project with the company Active Space Technologies to design part of a robot that would operate and move these uh, diverter cassettes. And uh, a journalist called me, I was in Barcelona at the time, and asked me some questions and I said in Portuguese, I use, we use, usually in English we say helium ashes, so I use, we use it to extract the ashes from the reaction. And I explained what the ashes is. But unfortunately the journalist only heard ashes. So the news, what it said there, was that we were working on the ashtray of ether. And uh, the title is the hash cleaner. Uh, so it was a very fast way to learn how to speak with journalists. Be very precise. And uh, don't, uh, don't use terms that they can uh, think uh, of anything else, because they will be very creative. Uh, so we use ashes, but it's not ashes. It's just in the term that it is the, re the remaining of the reaction. Uh, this is ether first plasma uh, several years ago. Actually, the first plasma, fusion plasma, hopefully now will be in 2030 after solving all these problems, 2030, 2032. With all these problems, there was something that uh, probably will be different. Uh, one year ago, we were thinking that we would close the plasma in 2020, the machine in 2028. We would uh, do a discharge a political discharge, you know, we bring politicians, they cut, they press the button, they are happy, they clap, they go, we open the device and we continue working. So now with these, all these problems, the schedule will be redone in such a way that when we do the first plasma, then we go to, towards the direction. We already have most of the components inside to do the first hydrogen discharges, then go to deuterium discharges, and then about 10 years after, start DT operation. To, uh, to really do fusion. DD also has fusion, but much less neutrons. So why we do all this? First, it is clean. The remainings of the reaction, the ashes, are, is uh, helium. So this is quite important. So it's uh, good for the carbonization, CO2 free. Uh, it is almost waste free. I already speak about uh, the, uh, I will speak about the waste, the radioactive waste. And the fuel is abundant. So we have deuterium for 3 times 10 to the 11 in the ocean and lithium on Earth for 30,000 years and uh, on the oceans for 13 million years. 
if you are not uh, listening to the previous talk, you will be wondered why he's speaking about lithium, but now you know. <laughs> I, I'm going to tell you again, but uh, you know that lithium is quite important to produce the tritium. So, and uh, with the uh, uh, deuterium existing in 45 liters of water and lithium from a battery, I'm able to produce as much energy as burning 40 tons of coal. Now, about waste. We have some uh, activated materials inside. Even, for instance, e uh, one example, the vacuum vessel. Even if you have a very uh, pure uh, um, stainless steel designed for these, uh, all, you always have impurities you know, in the stainless steel. And these impurities get activated with neutrons. And because they get activated, you will have some radiation in there. You will have activated materials. So the materials that we are going to produce with, with what we know now uh, are going to decay in about 100 years, about 100, 200 years to a level that is below the coal, uh, the ashes of coal. So very fast anyway, when you compare to a nuclear reactor. But we are developing and trying to develop other materials that decay even faster, or that they, they, they don't get that much activated. Now, fusion also has to be competitive. For us, competitive, it has to compete. If we manage to do fusion to produce electricity, in the end, it comes to cost. And it has to be competitive and compared to what are the best cost uh, energy production at the time. So uh, our aim is to be at least as uh, expensive as nuclear. And people say nuclear is very expensive. So just look into offshore wind cost for Portugal, and you will sink twice if nuclear is expensive. I don't know if you were the 30,000 30, million euros that 10 gigawatts of offshore costs in Portugal, according to the government. So it's quite expensive. So compare that with a, a nuclear power plant. So it's not, uh, so we aim to have much less cost here, but of course, we don't know. We just have estimates. And the other aspect is safe. I'm going to show you what safe means. So this is a discharge from jet. It will be a very boring discharge. What you will see, you, you will see some movement induced on the bottom of the device. It was induced to spread the power load. So it's very boring until you start moving the plasma. Uh, you see, this movement was induced. But in this particular discharge, a magnetic coil failed. A magnetic coil, no, a magnetic sensor failed. And the control system was not able to detect the position of the plasma and move the plasma towards the wall. And what happens is that when we move the plasma towards the wall, you have a disruption. The, content of, uh, the energy content that you had in the plasma suddenly is released towards the wall. But that's it. It finished. That's why it's safe. The problem is it's so difficult to keep the plasma running. If it was easy, we would already have nuclear fusion. So it's so difficult to keep the plasma running that it becomes safe just because of that. Anything that goes wrong, it stops. We always also have very few amounts of fuel inside. You could just cut the, the fuel supply and it stops. So this adds to the safety of fusion. So in the end, why we do all this? To keep the lights on. So it's fun to do plasmas. It's fun to work in nuclear fusion, but we need to keep, target, uh, to keep eyes on our target. And our target is electricity production and to have a power plant. So the aim is to have at least one, well, not at least, the aim compared to a, a nuclear power plant is to have one gigawatt power plant. Uh, and actually, in the end, I didn't mention to you how we are going to produce electricity. But basically, it's boiling water. So it's a very expensive boiler, but we are going to boil water or a fluid. Because in the end, uh, a thermal power plant or a nuclear power plant, they are just boilers, uh, very expensive boilers. But you want to produce vapor that is going to, to act on a turbine and then you produce electricity through a generator. And that's what we are going to do. We are only changing the heat source by a different type of boiler, a fusion boiler. Uh, so to do that, we need to extract the heat from the plasma. Uh, and that's where we need the blanket modules, the test blanket modules. And that's where the lithium comes in. So as the previous speaker mentioned, Tritium is not abundant. T tritium has a half-life of about 12.3 years, which means if I have one kilogram of tritium today, 12.3 years from now, I have half a kilogram. And uh, 24.6 years from now, I have 250 grams, which is not, well, as a fuel uh, selection, is not brilliant because we have a fuel that disappears, it evaporates. 
uh, over time. And actually, the inventory of tritium in the world is about a few kilograms. So tritium is produced by cosmic rays or on a nuclear reactor in Canada, a Gandu, that produces the tritium that we use now. So we need to find a way to produce tritium. And that's where lithium comes. So if you have lithium on the wall, uh, you can use, uh, there are different uh, ways of putting. People are thinking about pebbles or different approaches for lithium. If you have lithium on the wall, and with the neutron that is coming from the reaction, you are able to produce tritium. You extract the tritium, but in this reaction, you deposit heat. And if you are able to extract this heat, you, and then you do the exchange, you are able to produce electricity. So that's where uh, the idea comes from. We need this breathing blanket. Ether will only have two test breathing blankets. They were three, now they are two. Actually, I couldn't check if it is true, but people tell me, uh, told me that the breathing blanket, Ether is, uh, I didn't mention, but it is a project in, uh, from China, Japan, Europe, Russian Federation, United States, India, and South Korea. All of them. All of them have shared intellectual property, except for the breathing blankets. Why? Well, that's where the money is. If you do the fuel and you extract the heat, all the rest, uh, well, you, it's easy. But this is the complicated part. And actually, this is one of the biggest challenge in fusion. It is a challenge that even inertial fusion would have to, to face. Because on inertial fusion, they also need tritium. And they also need to do the heat exchange. Now, when fission will be produced? So because I'm modern, I decided to ask ChatGPT. Uh, it's an oracle now. Uh, so ChatGPT says, well, it's an oracle, but it, it doesn't like to compromise. So you will see this. Predicting is, is challenging, it says, in the next few decades, more or less. Uh, and he also says, overcoming the tele technical ch challenges and refining fusion technologies and securing sufficient funding is complicated and depends, of course, and practical fusion power is complex. So uh, ChatGPT Oracle was not very useful. Uh, so it's, it doesn't like to compromise. But it was roughly correct. It didn't, it didn't lie. Uh, but it's a much, much better. So if you believe in Sheldon, so you will have fusion in 2560, more or less. Deuterium, deuterium fusion. So maybe he has somewhere there deuterium tritium. But Sheldon is wrong, I hope. And uh, the aim is 250. And why? Because at the moment we are operating jet, we are building ITER. And at the same time that we are building ITER, we are building DEMO, which is a demonstrating reactor to produce electricity. Actually, when I mention DEMO, it's not one DEMO. Eurofusion, the European laboratories have one DEMO. United Kingdom is designing a DEMO called STEP. And they are very aggressive designing STEP. They are even, uh, they already have a site. They already have companies involved. They are going very fast. It's not a big demo, but step, they aim to produce electricity by 2040. Uh, China also has. So nuclear fusion is in fashion now. Uh, it's really in fashion. This is, a, this is spring summer collection 2023 based on the nuclear fusion. So they say from Gabriela Erst. Uh, but uh, uh, the reason I say it is in fashion is because actually there's a lot of money going in, private money going in into fusion. There are at the moment about 35 different companies, private companies, investing in fusion. Different concepts. Some that look like a tokamak, is, I think probably is the most promising one. And some other very many different ideas. Some using, for instance, proton borom uh, reactions. Some using deuterium-deuterium reactions. Some using helium-3 reactions. Probably they will operate on the moon because we don't have that many uh, helium-3 uh, uh, on <coughs> Earth. Uh, but uh, there are a lot of investment going on. The problem is that they are promising a lot. So the stakes are very high. I even saw one that uh, signed a contract with Google to supply electricity in 2028. Uh, so uh, they are very aggressive. I don't think that they are going to do, do that. It would be great if they achieve, if any of these projects achieved results. But uh, what it shows is that there are a lot of innovation going on. And with all this innovation, they will bring new knowledge into the field. For instance, one of the tokamaks that was in there, they are using high temperature superconductors. This can be a really game changing, high temperature superconducting. Because you can have very high magnetic fields, it will compact the device, so it will uh, reduce the needs for materials, so it will reduce costs. So basically, uh, we are looking towards tomorrow's energy, trying to replicate uh, energy uh, from the sun. And if you want to know a bit more, 
You can read my book. Uh, you can just download. It's free. And I update it regularly. Thank you very much.